This week on Christian World News, speaking up for Pastor Yusuf Nardakani as a new administration takes over, these Christians are highlighting religious repression in Iran and calling on the President Biden administration to act. Plus, preparing for the Pope. Iraq's Christians are devastated by war and terror. What impact will the Pontiff's visit have on this shrinking community? And poisonous snakes, biting insects, and sharp thorns. How did North Carolina's dismal swamp become a refuge for 50,000 runaway slaves? And what we're learning about them today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. We're glad you're here. Well, religious freedom is taking a role in U.S.-Iranian relations. The two nations are preparing to re-enter negotiations over the rogue regime's nuclear program. And that is why religious freedom advocates are calling on the Biden administration to make the Islamic Republic's uh, persecuted prisoners part of the deal. Jennifer Wishon explains. Yusuf Nadakani is the leader of the Evangelical Church in Iran. He was pastoring a thriving flock of 400 members when he was violently arrested in 2018. It was his most recent in a long record of run-ins with Islamic law enforcement that included being sentenced to death, all for practicing his Christian faith. He's currently incarcerated at the nation's notorious Evan prison, and he's not alone. Iran routinely mistreats, imprisons, and tortures non-Muslims. The Iranian government must be held accountable for their abhorrent treatment of Pastor Yusuf. Now, as the Biden administration works to reestablish talks with Iran over its nuclear program, religious freedom advocates say the U.S. must use every ounce of leverage to help the persecuted. The continued unjustified detainment of prisoners like Pastor Yusuf increasingly jeopardizes Iran's already unstable position. Commissioner Johnny Moore quoted Wang Shen Yu, an American who was held hostage for three years in the same prison that houses Pastor Yusuf. Iran has demonstrated that it changes its behavior only in response to strength in the form of American-led international pressure. If the present administration returns to the JCPOA without extracting concessions from Iran beyond the nuclear threat, it will relinquish all U.S. leverage over the regime. Diplomacy can't succeed without leverage. Appeals to the Biden administration came during a hearing to highlight the Prisoners of Conscience program sponsored by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Family members advocated for their loved ones who've been jailed for their faith or belief. Susanna Coe spoke about her husband Raymond, who served as pastor of the Evangelical Church of Malaysia before disappearing during this well-orchestrated abduction. He loves to tell Bible stories to whoever that is willing to listen. Since the commission began its Prisoners of Conscience program, 14 have been released. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Thanks, Jennifer. Pope Francis is visiting Iraq in coming days, seeking to encourage the dwindling Christian community there. Since the 20, uh, 2003 U.S.-led invasion, militant attacks and the rise of ISIS forced as many as one million Christians to flee the country. Many people decided to migrate because of the incidents that happened during the time of the terrorist gangsters of Daesh. That's when they started to occupy these areas and displace many of the families, in fact, all the families that were living in these villages. Even though ISIS for the most part is gone, traditionally Christian villages remain half empty as many Christian families are not returning. A priest in the northern city of Mosul says they've resettled elsewhere. The return of the Christians to the city of Mosul is in fact very modest. There is no significant return of Christians. The majority of the Christians who were living in Mosul are now either outside Iraq, in foreign and western countries, or they are in the Kurdistan region. The Vatican says the purpose of the Pope's visit is to show the church you are not alone. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has made several trips to Iraq. He's here to tell us more about the Christians there. Chris, what impact did ISIS have on the Christian community in Iraq? 
Well, Georgia was devastating. I have vivid memories of uh, being there just after ISIS went into places like Mo Mosul and Karachkosh, talking to Christians who had just left uh, their lives and livelihoods uh, behind. Uh, they were given four choices sometimes. They could die, they could uh, convert to Islam, uh, they could stay and pay the Jizr tax, or th they could flee, which most of them did. And uh, just a devastating time for many of those uh, ancient cr Christian churches, ancient Christian communities that literally had to flee for their lives. Uh, you know, and it devastated Iraq. And generally in the last 15 years or so, they've gone to maybe 1.5 million Christians, to about 250,000. ISIS had a big part in that. And is that partly the reason why so many are obviously reluctant uh, to return to their homes now? Yeah, because part of the story, George, is back in, uh, you know, before ISIS hit, Al-Qaeda was driving many of those Christians away from places like Baghdad and in uh, south of Iraq, and they went north. They made, many of them went to the Nineveh Plains, and then in 2014, uh, ISIS came in with a vengeance. Uh, you know, we were in uh, churches, we were in monasteries, and uh, ISIS were just such an anti-Christian uh, demonic group that would uh, devastate, uh, destroy churches, burn churches, uh, anything Christian uh, they, they would try to destroy. That's why many people are reluctant to go back. Yeah, uh, t talk to us about those who have uh, decided to stay. I know that there are there have been efforts between uh, Christians and Muslims to rebuild mosques as well as uh, churches. Both faith groups are helping each other. But tell us about those who have decided to stay. It's still very difficult for them, George. You know, some of the infrastructure that was destroyed by ISIS, uh, you know, it's going to take billions of dollars to replace. We were in a place called Karakosh. We saw the destruction of all those Christian homes and uh, the infrastructure. Uh, there are bright signs, like you say, between Muslims and Christians, but it's very difficult for them to rebuild their lives after being uh, such destruction and, and mayhem that they had to endure. Uh, and many uh, have fled and uh, may not ever come back. Uh, yeah, about a minute left, uh, Chris. This uh, visit by the Pope has to be very significant, uh, not just for the pontiff, but also for the people of Iraq, right? Definitely. I, I mean, there, it, there's a lot of uh, hope and encouragement that his visit is going to bring. It is short, and it, uh, whether or not it has a long-term uh, effect remains to be seen. There is a quote from one Christian there. He said, uh, you know, the Pope can't help us, but go only God can. And uh, so uh, ultimately, I think uh, these believers, these brothers and sisters are going to be looking to the Lord, and that's why they need our support, prayers, and encouragement, uh, you know, after being uh, so devastated by ISIS and other Islamic groups. Yeah, uh, my understanding is that the Pope is uh, scheduled to meet not only with Christian leaders in Mosul, but he'll also be meeting with top Islamic leaders uh, in Iraq. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the broadcast, buddy. Thanks, George. Coming up, after 26 years of ministry in America, this pastor felt a tug on his heart. We'll tell you where he went and about his amazing leap of faith right after. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep as the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the events shaping the world. It's what starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 9.30 on the CBN News Channel. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. 
life. Live it fully. CBN.com. Welcome back to Christian World News. He was a popular pastor of a thriving church. So why did he give it all up to go to Africa? I know, your yeah. homeland. Yeah. <laughs> I sat down with Michael Simone to learn about his leap of faith and why he says he'd do it all over again. Take a look. God supplied our need. Michael Simone felt born to preach, and he did just that for 26 years mostly at Spring Branch Community Church in Virginia Beach, a church he helped grow from a few people meeting in a house to more than 3,000 members. Then one day, he says he felt a tug on his heart, and the Lord whispered, I'm going to take you somewhere else now. There's a new adventure. That new adventure began with a chance meeting in Denmark with Michelle, a pastor from the West African nation of Togo. I didn't know what to say, and I thought, what would be a good question? to ask this man. An icebreaker. Yeah, I thought, ah, I have it. <laughs> A really good American question. What is your dream? And the next words that he spoke changed my life because he said, my dream is to save my village. Will you help me? Michelle's dream involved digging water wells, something Michael knew very little about. His problem was people in his village were always sick. Children were sick, animals were sick, everybody had intestinal parasites. They didn't have access to clean water, so they couldn't grow their crops. So everything falls apart without the water. A year later, Michael and a few others flew to Africa to dig a well for Pastor Michelle's village. But there was a problem. A geological study was saying that there's no way that we could get water at this village because 40 feet, 50 feet down, you would hit granite rock that was so thick that unless you were going to drill through it, there was no way that you were going to get water. So I said to my team, I'm still going, but you don't have to go if you don't want to. Everybody on the team said, we're going. On Sunday, about 500 villagers showed up for an outdoor church service. I said to them, let me tell you what it says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20. It says, the God of heaven will give us success. He is faithful to us. I was hanging by a thin thread of faith. We must be faithful to him. All week long, they drilled, but no water. We got down to the last day, to the last half hour of the day when we had to leave. In the last few moments, they installed this pump, this special pump, and then they capped it with a, a, a pumping device, a handle, and we all sat there and held our breath and they started pumping. And as they started pumping, all of a sudden water came flying out. It, it like flew over everybody. The, the villagers were all excited and clapping and laughing and smiling. It was like somebody just won the Super Bowl. But it wasn't over. A year later, Michael went back to check on the village and visit his friend Michelle when his friend said, We need Big Wata. And I said, what is Big Wata? He said, we have to go deep. So what he was saying is you have to drill down through the granite. You have to go down about 100 yards, so 300 feet straight down to hit a major aquifer. And if you can hit a major aquifer, you can have water forever. Because that well that you had just done was just for one village. One village, and it was only rainwater because of the rainy season. Big water equals big money, though, right? To do that project is a $60,000 project, whereas to drill one well is a $2,000 project. So we raised $60,000. So Michael and his team went back. We drilled through the granite straight down. We hit the big aquifer. It was, it just exploded. Water exploded everywhere. We capped it. We built the tower. We bought the pipes. So all of a sudden, 22 villages had water. Did you think you were done then? I did. I thought, okay, we did big water, but then it turns out now we're doing big water too. Michael now realized this was where God was calling him, and he started the Togo Network. My goal is to build uh, a network, which is why we call it Togo Network, of people and churches and businesses who will wrap their arms around this, this tiny West African country and say, 
we're going to bring the water, we're going to bring the medicine, we're going to bring the education, we're going to help take care of the orphans with you. Uh, we're here to serve you. Michael says their mission to dig deep wells that can supply hundreds of villages has no end. They're already looking toward Big Water 3 and beyond. God said, your last run is this. You're going to get water and health to people in West Africa because that's on my heart. I love that. Well, precious commodity that we take for granted in the U.S., but in Africa, it's gold. It's gold. Yeah. And thank God for people like Michael Sumo. Yeah, awesome. Well done. Folks, up next, the dangerous swamp that became a place of refuge, now a hiding place for runaway slaves. It has become a community of hope. Yeah, buddy. How many nickels are in a dollar? There are 20 nickels Look, in a dollar. How do birds fly? Does milk really make my bones stronger? Yeah, yeah. Daddy, when we die, will we go to heaven? Do you have the answer to life's biggest question? Call the 700 Club. We'll help you find answers to the important questions life brings your way. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs from health to entertainment you won't find anywhere else. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope all in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. To watch the CBN News Channel, download the app or visit CBNNewsChannel.com. Hello, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, board-certified neurologist and number one New York Times best-selling author. Wouldn't it be great to boost your energy, eliminate brain fog, and even reverse brain disease? Well, you can, and I'm gonna show you how, along with some of the world's most well-respected brain experts in this DVD, Protect Your Brain. Get Protect Your Brain, a free DVD, only from the Christian Broadcasting Network. Featuring experts on the cutting edge of neuroscience and brain health. No matter how many times you've failed in the past, you really can do this. In Protect Your Brain, you'll discover simple strategies to keep your brain young and healthy. Improve your memory. Discover the gut-brain connection. In Protect Your Brain, get your free copy at CBN.com or call 1-800-700-7000. If you want to improve the quality of your life, get the DVD, Protect Your Brain, and get it today. Snakes, insects, flies, and thick cover. The Great Dismal Swamp is a thriving refuge for wildlife. Wildlife. But <laughs> years ago, it was another type of sanctuary. Who once lived here in hiding? Charlene Erod brings us the story. The Great Dismal Swamp once covered nearly a million acres between northeastern North Carolina and southeastern Virginia. Between 1620 and around the time of the Civil War, it served as a thriving refuge for runaway slaves who chose to build their lives here in freedom no matter the conditions. You have uh, venomous snakes biting in insects and flies, um, thick cover of green briars, a great place as a refuge for wildlife, not as much probably a great place refuge for people. As many as 50,000 runaway slaves called maroons, an indigenous term, settled here on small rises of land known as Mesic Islands. Chris Lowy manages the swamp's National Wildlife Refuge in Suffolk, Virginia. The amazing part about the escaped slaves living here in the swamp is that the conditions living in here were better for them than being enslaved. And that is, uh, yeah, that is a difficult concept to understand today. They established hidden communities in these heavily treed wetlands, building cabins and possibly farming small plots of land. Researchers believe the former slaves fed their families by hunting deer, wild turkey, and other game skills they may have learned from Native Americans who also sought shelter here. The runaways went to great lengths to keep their settlements secret due to fear of being captured by slave owners. Dr. Dan Sayers, an archaeologist at American University, has studied the Maroon Islands for more than 10 years. What I'm finding out there in the middle of the swamp is these big old cabin footprints and a fire pit and all this stuff that shows uh, 
you know, that this is a really active landscape. And most, not to say all, most of the material culture or artifacts um, is is stone. And it's in, in equally abundant is burnt sand and clay. Sayers realized he was on to a significant discovery. It'd be little pieces of clear glass. It'd be a couple white clay tobacco pipe fragments, uh, some iron or metals uh, fragments or little pieces. Oh, a smattering of nails, some lead shot, a couple gun flint chips. It was enough stuff. Um, that I w- artifacts. I was able to definitely feel and definitely know that this was of historic period. As a direct descendant of a slave who helped to build the Great Dismal Swamp, Eric Shepard shares a personal connection to this history. The story of the enslaved people that uh, escaped the plantations and went and lived in the swamp um, was really, uh, I guess, first uh, introduced to me yeah. Uh, in the in the slave narrative of, of my ancestor Moses Grandy, where he was employed as a, a boatman or waterman. Grandy traveled the swamp's canal and learned to navigate boats as logging operations and trade expanded at the site. He and other slaves dug the canal in several ditches by hand. As the swamp is today, yes, slave labor, um, those people have a permanent Um, mark on the swamp as it is today. After arranging to buy his freedom, Grandy dictated his story, sharing about life as a slave and working in the swamp, never mentioning his interactions with escaped slaves living deep in the swamp. He had to still uh, be mindful of when he shared his story, uh, that it was You had to protect the people. It was a certain amount of secrecy. While many made the swamp their home, others saw it as just a stop on their journey north as part of the Underground Railroad. The Dismal Swamp was a refuge. It was a, a haven for the Underground Railroad activity. But can you imagine down in Louisiana, if you get to the Dismal Swamp, you're almost home free. In 2004, the refuge was designated an important landmark on the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Freedom maroons in the swamp preferred to living in captivity. On the one hand, it tells us uh, just how horrible slavery was, right? And really, let's not forget the racism and the, and the white supremacy part of that. When slavery ended in 1863, residents were free to leave the shadows of the swamp, moving to surrounding communities, a time Shepard compares to the biblical account of Israel's deliverance from bondage. How did God deliver them out? Who can't explain it? It's only one explanation. The same God yesterday, today, and forever. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Wow, incredible incredible story. story. Thanks, Charlene. Well, stay with us. We go inside Israel right after this. Are you suffering from feeling tired or worn out during the day? Can you not turn off your brain at night? You are not alone. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Bruce, The Sleep Doctor, and I've partnered with the Christian Broadcasting Network, and we're gonna bring you some unbelievable information that you can use tonight to get a better night's rest. Wake up to your best life. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com to get your free copy of Protect Your Sleep today. Nutrition, exercise, essential oils, weight loss, and more. It's Healthy Living with Lori Johnson. Talk about what's in this. Join CBN health reporter Lori Johnson to get the latest information from today's top health experts. This is fantastic. Find out what you need to know to live a healthier life. Watch Healthy Living, Tuesday night at 9.30. Superbook fans, here's something else you'll love. <laughs> it's the new Superbook Bible app. <laughs> it's packed with games, activities, and Superbook episodes that you can watch for free. Oh no! There's trivia, a fun daily devotional, and answers to your Bible questions. Plus, an easy to understand Bible the whole family will enjoy. You can even create your own Superbook character. Ta da! Oh, ho, ho. No super balls, man. Come with. Oh, sorry, pardon me. Sorry. 
Excuse me. Ouch! Are you getting this? Earn super points to win daily prizes, too. And so much more! <sighs> Time to get back to my adventures. See you soon. It's the new Superbook Bible app. Free downloads on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. One of the oldest copies of the Book of Esther has been gifted to Israel's National Library. Well, it comes just in time for the Jewish holiday dedicated to Esther's sacrifice. Emily Jones has that story and more from Jerusalem. Welcome to Jerusalem for this Inside Israel report, where we show you what's happening in Israel and the Middle East. Israel is caught in the middle of a face-off between Iran and the U.S. over the Iranian nuclear deal. Iran has officially started restricting international inspections of its nuclear sites in a bid to pressure the West to revive the 2015 nuclear deal and lift crippling economic sanctions. But the U.S. says Iran must first comply with the nuclear agreement before sanctions are lifted. Israelis fear this tension between the U.S. and Iran could spill over into a battle on Israel's northern border. With Biden trying to get back into the nuclear deal, Israel might decide it has to take preemptive military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. And then what would be Iran's counterpunch? Almost certainly it would be by ordering the Hezbollah military to fire its 150,000 or so missiles and rockets here at Israel, which would be devastating. Meanwhile, satellite images reveal a dramatic construction project underway at Israel's secretive nuclear facility in the city of Dimona. Israel neither confirms or denies it has nuclear weapons, but says it will ensure Iran never gets one. Israeli researchers say they have developed a drug that can potentially save the lives of people with moderate to severe COVID cases. It's called ExoCD24, and after giving it to 30 COVID patients, researchers at a hospital in Tel Aviv were shocked to find that all 30 recovered, most of them within days of taking the drug. It is very simple. You give it to patients, to patients with severe disease before they're going to deteriorate into very severe disease that mandate ventilations and even mortality. The researchers say the drug is cheap and the patient saw no side effects. They will continue testing the treatment in the remaining two phases of human trials. Israel's National Library recently received one of the world's oldest copies of the Book of Esther, just in time for the Purim holiday. This scroll on your screen originates from the Iberian Peninsula and dates back to around the year 1465. Every year, millions of Jews around the world read the story of Esther during Purim to remember how God saved the Jewish people. 15th century Jews in Portugal or Spain would have likely read from this scroll during their own Purim celebrations. For more stories like this, you can watch our Jerusalem Dateline program at cbnnews.com. Back to you. Thank you, Emily. Wishing everybody a happy Purim. It's a very happy holiday. Yes, it is. <laughs> all right, folks, that's it for this week's edition of Christian World News. Until next week, from all of us here, goodbye and God bless you.